Well, thank you all for coming today. I appreciate it greatly. You're taking time to come out and spend a little bit with me and, and what it is I do as photographer. Uh, just as a, what you had uh, as you walked in is um, one of the, the passions that I happen to enjoy right now as a photographer, and that's aviation work. That photograph, the plane I was photographing there, that F2G-2, it's $11 million aircraft. First race back in 1947, and was actually built by Goodyear back then, and it was designed to go after kamikazes at the end of World War II. So hopefully when I'm that old, I'm flying that well and worth that much. <laughs> but I'm a wildlife photographer, so the odds are slim I'm going to reach that, okay? Now, I am a wildlife photographer. A lot of people wonder uh, what it is I do, because how many people go to my blog? That's impressive. Okay, so all six of you know that uh, I do a lot of things with a camera. I am a photographer. I have been for since the beginning, as far as I can, can remember back. And my whole goal is simple, to tell stories with, with what I see. I'm incredibly fortunate. I've been to some amazing places. I've seen some amazing things. And in that process, I try to bring back those stories. Now, I'm a wildlife photographer. How many people here are wildlife photographers? Yeah, about the usual number for city folks, not a whole lot. <laughs> That's okay. That's all right. We're going to talk about that. I live in a, a very unique part of this, this country. It's up in the Sierra Mountains. My house is literally, the driveway is 8,200 feet in elevation. In a normal year, I'll have 25 feet of vertical snow in my front yard about January 10th. So it's a very unique part of, of what we call North America. But there's many, many unique places. And I want to talk a little bit about how you as a photographer, even here in, yeah, I assume most of you are uh, locals, might not think about where wildlife is and what you can do with it. So without any further ado, now we got a little bit of light on the screen, so some of the things that I do as a photographer, the subtleties you might not see, but we'll get by all right. Um, the, David, the thing on the corner, the left corner, is that going to go away at some point? Thanks, because that's not me. <laughs> All right, so the guy figured out the technical problems. Since I never do anything conventionally, let's start off with the questions. Anybody have a question? Yeah, see, it's back on you now, huh? Thought I was going to talk the whole time. <laughs> yes, sir? What's the blog address? What's the blog address? I'm really well hidden. Moosepeterson.com. <laughs> if you want to email me, guess what it might be? People always go, I can never find your email address. Moose at moosepeterson.com. Hard to figure that one out. Yeah, I, um, anybody know the KISS theorem? Last word's the most important part when it comes to me, okay? So if you want to figure out how Moose does something, he's going to keep it real simple. Why? If no other reason, it's repeatable. As photographers, when you make things complicated, what happens? You might find success, and the next time you try to duplicate it, can you? You know, I don't know about anybody else, but I'm human. I, I, I just can't do that, so I keep it simple. That way, when it's successful, I can repeat it, and when it's not successful, I didn't spend much time learning it. Okay? Yeah. Yes, ma'am? Were you always a wildlife photographer? Was I always a wildlife photographer? It's an excellent question. Um, I was very fortunate, and I was brought up in California in two places, San Diego and the Sierras. So I spent most of my time outside. And so wildlife photography um, just seemed the natural way in which life was taking me. I really like to take credit for it, but I can't. It's just the way life kept pushing me. It just kept like saying, go this way. And uh, you know, when it comes to wildlife itself, um, you know, it's just one of those things, the biologists I work with all um, say I have the Doolittle effect. Um, I just, I don't want to say talk to wildlife, but for, for lack of, of better terms, I can kind of, for the most time, understand where we're going in this relationship of photographer subject. And in that process, I can get the shots I'm getting. So it's just what I've always done. And in, I'm going to talk about that a lot today because it's, it's really hard for, for you, um, the person that's just visiting either moosepearson.com or my book, Captured. And you look at these pictures, you go, wow, you know? And if you say that, thank you very much. Um, but. Um, I know when I started out, and I looked at, at photographers' books at the time, I go, wow. And it's not till you realize, as time goes on, that to get that wow shot is just to put in that thing called time. It's really no more, no less. It's not a camera brand. It's not a secret recipe. It's just that everything in life just 
takes time. Nothing happens instantly. Um, but people tend to want that instantly, and that's what causes issues. How are we doing on the, the, the graffiti on the screen? <laughs> Not that I'm picky, but I don't want text with my yeah, photographs. No, no, no. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, how much is your shot exactly what you want, and do you do any work to get the shot you want when you finally? That's a really good question. How much of what I is the shot mine, and how much is elsewhere? Now, I am a, I am kind of a, I'm a strange dude. Period. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I, I I started out in this business back in the days of film. Back when, if you goofed up the shot, you'd have to send it to a retoucher. There was nothing called Photoshop back then. The retoucher would get 400 bucks an hour for his time, right? And I'm getting 500 bucks for my hour. So if I have to send it to a retoucher to fix my picture, what happened to your profit? Okay? And I'm a business guy, and that is a really important driving point of, of what we do. So it comes to my wildlife work to answer the question, what you see is what I shot, period. Okay? For a lot of reasons. The main one being that what I'm showing, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you images, I'm photographing history. Um, history that will be, and in many cases, is gone. So that responsibility um, I take very seriously. And so I've always held myself to the basic code of ethics when it comes to photojournalism, which means you can crop, burn, and dodge. And I don't even do that with my wildlife work. So what you see is what I shot. Now it comes to my landscape work, it's a totally different ball game, okay? And so then I'm going to use tools to finish, I'll talk about uh, this afternoon, to finishing those landscape shots, okay? And that include Photoshop. But one thing, whether it's my wildlife, my landscapes, or my aviation, one thing is I never crop, okay? I don't crop and post. That is uh, very simple, that's how I came up in this business. You know, when you had a 35 millimeter slide, everybody remember those what this word, little thing about this big, it's in a cardboard mount in the very beginning, then it's in a plastic <laughs> mount after that. Okay, just so you know, we're all on the same page. Um, when I send that into a photo buyer, a photo editor, right, and if I were to put silver tape on it and crop it down, so you got this little like, like this, the person looked at their loop and they go, what, couldn't you get it right? Um, and that means you ain't getting no payday. So I, I still crop in the viewfinder. I don't do it in post, no matter what I'm shooting. And that's, those are just Moose's old habits. That's just the way I do it. On the flip side, it's that mark of quality of that image that keeps me a survivor. You know, I'm still, after 31 years, about to start 32 years in this business, still in the business. Um, and it's very important. You know, I was, it seems really weird, but we had a, a high point this last year. Um, a bus in San Francisco was wrapped with one of our, our photographs, the salt marsh harvest mouse. So the photograph is enlarged, big enough to wrap around a whole mouse, and it didn't fall apart. So that's, that's kind of important to me. So it's 1990, and I get a phone call. I found him. And I'm like, really? He said, yeah, I found him. Can you get down here? I said, yeah. So I drove a couple hours, got down to the Southern California coast just outside of San Clemente piece of coastal sage scrub, cliff area that had been there since long before we showed up on the shores. It was just prime virgin coastal sage scrub habitat. A very powerful family, a uh, newspaper family, owned the property and they were going to develop it into a big large resort. Now part of California is you have to do what's called EIR, in, uh, Environmental Impact Report. So this biologist, Greg, had been hired to go out there and survey this area. And he got there and threw out some traps and Spent about a month there, and when I got the phone call, he had found something that, well, had been extinct for over a decade. So I get down there, and it's, uh, it's nighttime, you know, and I get down there, and he says, hey, I've been kicked off the property. I said, say what? He said, well, they obviously don't want these found. They don't want the word getting out there. I said, okay. He says, we have to sneak in. Moose, <laughs> sneaking, right? So it's about midnight. We go out. The thing called Sherman Live Trap is a very common tool in the biology trade. and It allows you to, to capture small mammals, but it doesn't kill them. That's why it's called a live trap. So we threw them out there. We left for a couple hours. Came back after 2 a.m. Pitch black. Checking the traps. And you got to understand that checking traps is something I've done for 30 years. That's, that's part of the photographic process and what I do. I'll explain more on that as we go on. So getting near the end of the traps, hadn't caught anything, and he said, I found one. And he only found three before, so we found one. Odds were 
really slim. And so he got it and goes, okay, I gotta photograph it. Now you might not know what coastal sage scrub is here in, in Manhattan, but it's a it's basically, you could think of it as almost desert, okay? It's just a sandy soil with shrubs that may be 18, two feet tall. And let's say shrub. I'm talking about these real desertly kind of thin little plants. The sage isn't really much. And so he said, okay, I got to photograph it. And I said, right, it's nighttime. He goes, yeah. And I said, you got to photograph it. He goes, yeah, get to it. And I said, it's nighttime. He goes, yeah. I said, I've got to use flash. He said, oh, crap. So I'm shooting film, and we're out there in sage scrub, and the flash is going off, right? Everybody knows we're there. It's not like we're hiding, okay? We're lighting up this area. So I get off about two and a half rolls. This is 1990. Get the film, get their traps. We're going out the fence, because we had to get underneath this fence. As we're going out, the sheriffs are driving in, and the helicopter is overhead. We get out. The next day, I get a call from Washington. They said, did you get the pictures? And I said, I've got the pictures. This is it, this is the Pacific pocket mouse. At the time, it had been extinct for about 12, 13 years. No one knew um, they still existed. Since then, we found a couple of little pocket uh, populations of them. But it's what I do. Um, when it comes in the world of wildlife photography, I don't, um, and I really love to, go out and just kind of get those one shots. There's some, some marvelous wildlife photographers out there and what I call weekend warriors. And they, get out and they just get spectacular images and God bless them for doing it but that's not really what I do. Um, what I do is very niche oriented, it's very specific, it's very, I am, there's only one other guy who does what I do, uh, and Joel Satori does it very well for Geographic. And we go out and we work on these projects, and we get out and, and get photographs that, in some cases, things that have never been photographed before, or things that are, sad to say, about to disappear. So it's very specific, very niche kind of photography, did not happen overnight. You gotta understand, I love being with critters, okay? It's, it's just who I am, what I do, and it's kind of an oxymoron. When you think about what I do as a live for a living and, and what I'm doing now is I prefer to be by myself with critters in the middle of nowhere. And wherever is Moose today? Anything <laughs> but by himself in the middle of nowhere, right? Okay, and that's all right. Because the story I want to bring to you, and more importantly, you've got to understand this is a very self-serving presentation. It's very selfish. I have one very distinct goal for today. That's to infect you not only in photography, but wildlife photography. And not only wildlife photography, but getting out there and sharing what it is you're seeing. And sharing it how? By photography. And you understand, I like getting close. This is my, our youngest son, Jake. We like getting close to wildlife. Yeah, that's a grizzly bear kissing Jake on the cheek, okay? So getting close is what I do. That means I understand the biology, okay? I understand this is a family affair. My wife is back in the corner. My youngest son, I'm not sure, he's not too smart, but he decided he's gonna take up wild photography like his dad. It's like anybody knows the struggles of a wild photographer, you know it. I mean, as my good friend Wayne Lynch says in Canada, we wake up every morning unemployed, because we do, okay? We have to go out and find that is the thing to make a living. Now, I don't want to depress you with that because it's really, that's just life, no matter what you do. I want to get you inside it with the, the glorious part, the, 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 the amazing part. I mean, I've been to places you can't imagine. I've been and seen things that you can't imagine this planet has to offer, and that's still today with things that we have as disasters. So, you know, I pack a couple of things and I, I kind of like, jump in the aircraft and off I go, right? This is a, one of the great trips we went up out of Anwar. We flew into the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge and we, like my good friend Kevin Dobler and I, we floated for two weeks on the Conga River. An amazing trip seeing what most people never get to see in their lifetime. And that's what I do. It didn't start that way. It doesn't start that way for any wildlife photographer. That's the important thing to understand, okay? For you to get to that point, you have to start. And that's really important. You just start. Luckily, my start was with this little bird, okay, the Allen Hummingbird. A unique individual, a little female, because it has a gorget. Now, these photographs were taken back in the days when the F3, that's an F with a number three. So it doesn't start with a D, okay, first thing. Everybody understand, <laughs> right? It's a film based camera. And this is when TTL flash, nobody even knew what it was. So I used to take SB12s and SC, 
SC12 cords for the SB12, and I would solder these cords together so I could get two flashes to work TTL. Okay, that's changed a lot. And it started off the whole process of my taking biology and combining it with technology to take photographs so the critter never knew I was there. You have to understand, it's very important to me, that when I leave, that critter, I was totally negligent on its life. It never knew I even came in its world. I have no effect on it. Because to me, no photograph is worth sacrificing the whale for the subject. Because this little bird here, the least bells vario, um, there was 126 in the world when I started this project for the Forest Service, and I would strictly go out and find nests. And that's something that I can do. It's a sixth sense. It's, it's not from training. Because I understand I've never had a class in biology or wildlife or any of that stuff. Everything I've learned is from out there doing it, period. Again, that time thing. Best school, hard knocks, OK? And in the morning, I go out and look for them. In the afternoon, I get to photograph them. Now, how many people are f comfortable with flash? Not enough of you. I know it's scary. But how many know that when you take a picture of the flash, something that's closer than something that's further away, the thing that's closer is going to have more light on it? Anybody know that basic principle, the inverse square law? So the leaf there on the, on, the, on the far left, for example, OK, it's out of focus. We know it's physically closer than the bird, right? OK? And most people look at the highlights in the eye. I'm using two flashes. You only see one. So how can one, those leaves not be burned up since they're physically closer than the bird? Because this, this is a all flash photo. And two, how can there only be one highlight in the eye? I'm really freaking good at this stuff. <laughs> OK? You can be two. You just start off in your backyard. That's where I start, and that's where I still work. I mean, literally, I'm home. Here's my desk. Here's the blog computer. Blog, blog, blog. Turn over here, and here's the computer for the digital darkroom. And right here's my 600, shooting out the office I built right out the window to birds. I do it all the time. That's the only way you can stay sharp. The only way you can stay consistently good at what it is you do. I mean, this is your basic northern mockingbird. It's here. It's everywhere. It's around the globe almost nowadays. This simple bird, it may be common, then don't take common photographs. Just right there, that simple challenge right out your window can get you down the road of wildlife photography so far, it'd spin your head. It doesn't take anything more than that. Just take an uncommon photograph of something common. So literally taking out my window, 600, OK, 1.7, boom, American Robin. Winter time. First challenge from a wildlife photographer. How can you make it better? Well, you do those same basic things. How many know my good friend Jay Mazel? Okay, great guy, right? What's he say? Light, gesture, color. You apply that to anything, and you win. So here we got not really much light, but we do have color and gesture. What do we do for light? We add flash. Flash brings things up, right? And of course, you bring out flash, and anything what happens? You get a little left cheek, a little right cheek, right? A little left cheek, back and forth, right? So all of a sudden, things start happening. You know, you just a little bit of light, and away you go. It's amazing, OK? Instantly from your backyard, what are you learning? You're learning how to put a subject on a perch, how to light that subject, the background. All that is coming right from your backyard, OK? It's right there. Let's say you start mastering that basics, right? Clean background, little flash fill. Take it outside. Take it past. The one thing I'm going to encourage you to do, no matter what kind of genre of photography you love to do, whether it's portraits, wildlife, race cars, architecture, whatever it happens to be, look at those photographs that you like in that genre. Figure out how they were taken. Not what f-stop and shutter speed, because personally, I ain't going to get you anywhere, right? F-stop is totally irrelevant. I probably never heard anybody heard you say that, right? F-stops are relevant. But in all seriousness, with what we can do with the mind's eye and how we can trick the mind's eye, you don't know what that is, come to the next session later on, I'll tell you. OK? It's irrelevant. More importantly is, where's the subject in the frame? This plain old black-tailed gnat catcher, there's flash fill going on. Why? It's an overcast, rainy day. That little bit of light brings that bird out. How do you learn that technique? Out your back window. How do you start looking for that thing called gesture, OK? This cactus wren's busy calling. How do you know to look at that bird to see it's about ready to call so when the click happens, you're ready for it? Look out your own bedroom window. 
how you start looking for things that aren't common. Well, if you don't see them outside your bedroom window or at home, it ain't common, right? It's new to you. How many people heard or know of Roger Torrey Peterson? Very famous guy, you know, he's the, the father of, of modern birding, okay? He and I were, we had some great times together, and he lived up in, in Old Lyme, Connecticut. He is now not longer with us, but, and he's not a family relative, but he was a really good guy. We were, we were thick as thieves for a long time. He'd come to the West Coast, and he wanted to photograph birds that were just like, you know, dirt birds, you know? We saw them all the time. And uh, I would never photograph starlings. Anybody know the history of starlings? Right, okay. The uh, Shakespeare Society thought they should have them in, in the New World. So they brought them over and they introduced them in Central Park. Now they've invaded the whole con continent. And he, he, you know, I said, I don't do common birds. You know, it's like, everybody can do common birds. And he'd go, you know, you're an implant. <laughs> yeah, I know, I'm not a native. <laughs> and getting skunked is part of the process. <laughs> Okay? Now, believe it or not, I have seen lots of skunks, okay? I have seen them at nighttime walking around doing their things. It wasn't until this May, after 30 years, I actually see one in the daytime that I could photograph that was still alive, of course. Um, roadkill doesn't really count. <laughs> and even then, I didn't get a great shot. So getting skunked is part of this process, okay? So you venture out, you do some photography, come back home where it's safe. Find some subject that's right thing, start working. Here's a, an Anna's hummingbird, a nest, okay, with a couple kids. How good are you with flash fill? How good are you sitting still to watch things happen? How well can you sit there and blend in and not affect the critter and get the shot? Where do you perfect those kind of skills? It's not spending tons of time and money going off to ask Alaska or Africa. That's where you go when you've got those skills. So you make the most of that time. Sit in your backyard. I mean, here's one of my favorite birds, okay? The white crown, um, her white crown sparrow. It's a, it's, a, it's a common bird, okay? We have three subspecies here in North America. This is, again, right out my window. You know, a little left cheek, little right cheek, back and forth again action. But right off the bat, you look at it, look at the perch. The perch is massive. It's massive. What does that do to that bird? It don't make it look so good, okay? How do you learn those little nuances? That's a major nuance in this thing called bird photography. You get into a small little perch, a little intimate perch, okay? And then once you get to that intimate perch, you learn how to find that, you find that intimate lighting, and instantly you start evolving as a wildlife photographer. And we're not going to Africa or Alaska to do this, okay? Time is really big important part of this thing called wildlife photography, so is money. I hate to say it, but it's not a cheap sport. Okay, just traveling and then spending the time out there to make the shot happen, you know, it adds up. So start practicing in your backyard. I mean, seriously, okay, mountain chickadee, shot with a 16 fisheye. I said to myself, I wonder how close I can get a camera body to a chickadee, right? So it's not filling the frame, but it's a fisheye. How close is it? It's on a magic arm, it's right up there, it's just right next to the entrance of one of the houses. We have a lot of birdhouses on our property, okay? So it's like, okay, cool. I've seen some of those photographs that you, you've probably seen, some spectacular ones, I don't have them, of you know birds flying in. What does it take to do that? So I said, all right, so I know it will sit there and come in close to my, my 16 fisheye, so then let's put up a couple flashes. And that's how I said, what if, what does it take? And I just started experimenting. One of the big keys to wild photography, being a problem solver. And you have to say, what if? And then you take that what if and you start yanking on it. And you start yanking on it. And you say, oh, how can I solve this problem? And you keep yanking on it. And sometimes it goes <laughs> okay? You don't write about those things. You definitely don't show those photographs, okay? <laughs> you just put in your head, that don't work. And then you go this way. And you pull on that string. <laughs> pull on that string. <laughs> pull on this string. Oh, this looks good. Blog. <laughs> okay? That's the process. You keep going out and shooting. I mean, you've got this shot here. It's a female black chin hummingbird. It's a rainy day, overcast light. When you've got that big giant umbrella overcast light out there, do you add flash? Hell no. That's a great light source. So you start looking at light, and you learn it just from your backyard because light here is the same as the light out there, the light over there, light over there. 
It might not be the same with Beijing and that smog, but it's, you know, it's just different colored light, all right? But light's light. And you start learning light, and life comes to you. You'd be surprised that one simple element, light, lets you take your photography anywhere you want. I've been doing aviation work for about five years now, and, and a lot of people are going, how'd you get so good so fast? It's just light. It's just on a different subject. But light is light. You learn light, you can do it all. This light, okay, it's an overcast day. It's snowing. What kind of light's on that Cassian Finch? Is it from the overcast? Look at the red. You ever seen a red that vibrant in an overcast light in the camera? So what have I got being put in there? Flill flash. Flash fill, okay? But can you tell? That means you're doing something correct. But you got to think of the process, okay? If you want the color on an overcast day, you're not going to get it from ambient light. You're going to have to have that 5500 Kelvin from the flash. Learn that in your backyard. It's amazing, California quail. My, my poor in-laws, you know, I go to their house. They wouldn't see me. They probably would probably a good thing. I was in the backyard. I was in their backyard, totally different habitat from what we had. And I'd work the birds in their backyard. And I sit there and go, okay, birds like perches. Perches are these nasty, gnarly kind of, you know, traps visually. And you're trying to photograph and you got all these things, spears going through heads. It's like, you don't want that in your photograph. How do you start working to get a clean shot? How do you start finding the perch with character? How do you get the bird to come to the perch with character? When you start asking those questions and finding the solutions, and you keep it simple, okay? One thing birds love, water. All right, curb bill thrasher, it's coming to water. Right now at my house, I have a bunch of bird baths with heaters in them because we left, you know, everything was frozen. It's winter time. Water, it's free, a little electricity for the keep the water unfrozen, and I've got birds at the wazoo coming just for the water, what's called free water. Even grosbeaks, one of my wife's favorite birds. They show up in the Sears um, in the springtime, and when we first moved there, we didn't see them for years except for certain spots, and then all of a sudden, one came to the house. We're like, ooh, cool, nice color. We had, I think this last year, I think it was like 14 pairs that showed up, okay, after feeding them for a decade. Another neighbor, okay, the, the dipper, right? It's a basic bird, you might say. It's, it, it swims underwater, it gets insects. It's really cool, it's your basic shot like people get. Well, how do you get beyond the, the common shot? Well, you gotta think about it. It goes underwater, it means it's got this thing called a nictane membrane that covers their eyes, like a diving mask. So you wanna get a shot of that going on. How do you do that? Well, you gotta get them in the water. Well, if the water is frozen, okay, for the fast shutter speed, what would the water look like? wouldn't have the romance, right? It would be really lots of detail. All that detail, where the mind's eye go? All that detail, wouldn't see the bird. So you gotta make things cleaner. How do you make things cleaner? This is the thought process of, of a photographer, and for a while photographer, you go, okay, I need a slower shutter speed, right? To blow the, the blur the water. But I do that, the bird's gonna be moving. Okay, how do I get the bird to not be moving in the shot? So is that sun or is that flash? It's only flash because you know I'm solving a problem, right? No. Okay? You've got to sit there and think about that. So it's just high noon sun, but there's a nictane membrane over the eyeball of him going through, and you see the little drops of water being frozen. So without showing all that busyness in the water, just the mere drops tells the story. And that's where the photography evolves. No matter what you're doing as a photographer, telling the story. Elegant Trogon gone out down in Arizona. Don't look so good, right? But this bird, which is about this long with that tail, it's a big bird, okay? It's, it's a Mexican, South American kind of throwback to dinosaurs, really bizarre kind of bird. It's got the funniest call, and I'm not gonna imitate it because I look really weird, okay? But if you go and Google it, you know, trogon call, it's something else, all right? Well, it goes to nesting cavities, telling the story. How do you tell a story? You gotta know a little bit about the subject. Big thing about photography, you know, as far as I'm concerned, is when it comes to storytelling, you've got to know about the subject. Yeah, you can be really lucky, okay? The photo gods can say, hey, you showed up today, I'm going to make everything happen for you, and that does happen. Remember that picture of the skunk? That happens more often, okay? <laughs> you've got to sit there and think about what is that subject. So this is kind of how my photography has evolved in the first years, is I spent a lot of time 
in the backyard practicing because I get home from nine to five and the subjects were there and I could practice and it cost me no time or money. It just took me some behind the, the lens time to sit there and answer questions and to fail, which is such an important part of photography, and then how not to fail. Then we got a phone call from, a, from, a, from a, a big nursery producer in California, and they wanted a Sam King kit fox for the logo. And he said, do you have that? I said, of course I do. I hung up the phone. I said, Sharon, we got to find kit fox fast. <laughs> so it's endangered critter. It's not like you just go out and find them. So there happened to be, and this is the only shot I have of, in all my files of a captive, and this is Keebler. If you want to know the story about Keebler, you can read it in my book, Captured. He's, he was... He was on TV. So we went to photograph Keebler, and we got the shot. And, and I got quite a bit, you could say, bitten by the Sam King Kit Fox, physically a bit smaller than your basic house cat. Very endangered critter. Um, it's my longest living project. This will be our 20, uh, go by my son's age, 26th year, OK, of working with the Sam King Kit Fox. And this is when I started going, OK, got these single clicks. Now I want to get back to what Moose does, and that's storytelling. I, I, I come from a long line of storytellers. Um, so I said, I want to figure out these, these kit fox. I've done all these birds up to that point in time. So it's time to get into mammals. Mammals are totally different. You don't have mammals in your backyard. Well, OK, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the mammals you have in here in New York, I'm not referring to those kind of, OK? <laughs> in fact, this is totally different. This is called a kangaroo rat. Okay, this is the giant kangaroo rat. The body is about the size of your fist, and they, they, their locomotion is like a kangaroo. They have that big long tail, and they can go jump in the air, and they swing the tail, and they can turn 90 degrees. Okay, and I met a gentleman who uh, turned out to be my mentor in, in many things, especially in, the, in mammalogy. And Dr. Williams was the guy who, who, was, who not only discovered them and got them listed as endangered, was out there working on a very long term project. And we went out to do this. And back in the days, okay, when we got these shots, this is the days of film. A lot of things that we take for granted nowadays. This is back with the 8008 film camera. One of the very first with a TTL flash with an AF illuminator on them. So back before that, you get out there, you know, he had a Pentax and he put the flashlight between his knees and he tried to take the, the flashlight knee to light, you know, get the beam of light on the, on the, on the kangaroo rack because it's nocturnal. And with a bending sit there and he would focus the lens then he'd look at the distance on his lens, and he'd look at the flash and go at this distance, and he'd f-stop. By this time, the animal's dead, okay? <laughs> right? So the first time I go out there with 8008, I'm just, because the AF illuminator would put the beam out there, the camera would focus, and the TTL would take care of exposure. And he's like, wow, this is amazing. And we've, we've been thick as thieves ever since then. And that's how I started getting involved in mammal work. That's how I got in the first photograph in Geographic. Um, I've never done any articles or anything like that with Geographic. They, they buy what's called stock images, uh, images where someone else can't get the picture and I have it, kind of what I do in this, on this planet. So this is the first photograph I had in Geographic. And I asked them, you know, and as you should if you're in the business, I asked the editor, why did you pick this one out over the rest? They said, it's a shadow in the background. And because I'm using multiple flashes, okay, one flash is lighting, the other one's creating the shape and that form that makes him look round and plump because they are, and that little shadow in the background makes them pop out. And those subtleties, when you have a, a, an editor from Geographic say, that's why he picked your picture, you go, subtleties, they're important, okay? Not only do I get published, I got a payday. That's why I've always stressed and always worked on subtleties in photography. It's so much more productive, so much more visually exciting, those subtleties. So then I go, oh, hey, this kangaroo rat stuff's kind of cool, right? Payday, Geographic, let's go find some more. So we went to this lighthouse in the uh, central coast of California where the Morro Bay kangaroo rats, the entire population in the world, all 20, 18, 19 of them, were all in these, these cardboard kind of uh, arenas trying to get them to uh, do that thing that mice and rabbits do so well. Um, it's extinct, okay? The only place you're gonna see it are in my files. It's gone. Um, but the Morro Bay kangaroo rat, it was in this very artificial world, okay? In the process of trying to, to save it. Well, how do I get a photograph of a captured guy that belongs in the wild that's about to go extinct? And this started off some of the specialty of what I do with my, my tanks. And, and this one is literally, I got on the site, I went there without knowing my subject, first rule that should not be broken. And I get there, I'm like, okay, unless I want pictures of a rat on cardboard or on plywood, I gotta do something. 
So they happened to have a plain old fish aquarium there. And I had a 35 to 70 28 lens, an old fashioned lens, with a 6T diopter I screwed on it. And I had a single flash, and that's how I took the photograph. That's, you know, considering it's extinct, to me it's criminal that that's the best we have uh, for a record of life, which is what I do. So then it came the Fresno kangaroo rat. I got the phone call, so typical. I found one, can photograph it. It's extinct. You're not going to see it again. And then I started getting doing more things. Then, of course, I come back to my favorite project, the kit fox. Kit fox, and, and I don't use blinds. So this is typical. This is out in a field in Bakersfield, California. Not what you think is a hotbed for wildlife photography, Bakersfield. Ugh, okay. And I'm in my, seriously, my kit fox chair. I've had it for 30 years. It's still with me. I'm sitting out in the middle of nowhere. They're looking because the male's sitting underneath my chair in my shade, so he's right, right there, okay? And the family's there watching, wondering what's going on, and doing what kit fox do. And seriously, when you have this in your viewfinder, this is all with a 4028, there's no way you can't get bitten by this bug called wildlife photography. And more importantly, get involved in getting those photographs out. So then we put in, I, wanna, I forget, way too many thousands of trap hours trying to look for this guy. Another critter that was thought to be extinct till we found him, the Amargosa vole. Now it's a nocturnal critter and we found him and we shot him and photographed him um, and we knew there's two because there's a pregnant female, which gave us hope, um, was to since they use basic photography. It's daytime, but it's a nocturnal critter. So how do you make it look like night? Flash is no longer fill, flash is now a key light. You crank that shutter speed, okay, up, 500, thousands, so that the ambient light's totally non-existent, and you have that flash doing the main exposure. So even after finding that subject, you've got to sit there and think about how you're going to photograph it. The Buena Vista Lake Shrew. Is it extinct? Is it around? That's a good question. Can you out, go out today and just go find one? No. Put it in a couple hundred hours, you might find one, maybe, okay? But again, this is in my tank. I actually took a class, one of the few classes I took, and how to make a museum diorama. You know those things you see there? Just to understand this process of using optical plexiglass and making these tanks and bringing in the real world to control these guys. Because a shrew, this is it. That's what a shrew does, okay? This is what they do. They keep doing it. They don't stop, back and forth. Um, they live about eight or nine months, at which point their teeth are flat and all they have is gums. Because they eat so much and they're just like this the whole time. They'll eat and then they stop. And they'll stop for two, three minutes, then they're this again. And that's their life. So you gotta get the photograph. The only way you're gonna stop them is flash, okay? And pre-focusing. Now, I do this kind of stuff, the red-legged frog, and you know, the delta smelt, but I'm really not a creepy crawly kind of guy. It's just not, getting down ground, sticking my ass in the air, it just ain't what I like doing, okay? Um, and nowadays, getting up is getting harder and harder, okay? But I've done these things. And, you know, people say, has a grizzly bear ever, like, come up and attacked you or has it scared you? Or have you ever, what's, what critters, like, ever really, like, threatened you or, or, or anything else? And I'm like, there's only one thing that, that almost killed me, and that was a fly. And I go, what? I always get, what? This is a Delhi Sands flower-loving fly. Uh, this guy almost killed me. Uh, I was, anybody from Southern California back in the 70s? Okay, the, the old uh, Colton Piano. Remember, Kale Colton Piano had ads on every, every channel, especially on Saturday Westerns, right? Well, their back property is the only place these guys were found anymore, and, it was, and it's usually in August in Banning Pass. It was 110 degrees that day, and almost died from heat um, that day. It was not a good scene. All to get the photograph of this guy who emerges for a heartbeat, goes out and finds a female for a heartbeat, and then they, they die, okay? That's the closest that anything's ever come to killing me in this wildlife realm. More likely, it's, it's being there, and this is such an important part of this whole process, I'm not alone. I work with biologists. They're the ones who get me where I need to be at the right time, because time is everything. The black skimmer chick just uh, hatching. You can see the egg tooth on the bill. You can see the lower mandible is already longer, because that's how they grow up to be adults. And right now, if you were a female black skimmer, you'd be getting really turned on because he's giving you the black eye. <laughs> And I wish I could say I'm making this stuff up. This is biology. And that's what fascinates me. I'm like, how do you know that's the black eye? And how do you know it turns them on? Right? I ask those kind of questions. I hike up waterfalls, which are really, excuse me, really not a safe place to go. The first one to photograph the black swift behind, because they nest behind waterfalls. 
It's an amazing critter. That, um, that little moss nest they have right there, they get it by picking it off the seedlings of the caves and they, they sit there and they, and they make their nest of it. They lay one egg and all day long they're gone. They're not foraging. They come back at night. They never incubate that egg. That's because that moss slowly degrades and that process of decomposing gives the right heat for the egg to sit there and fertilize and then to hatch. And my question is, how did the first swift know that would happen? <laughs> right? Seriously. It's an amazing part of this thing called life. I mean, I go into caves. Oh, God, these, things, these, these are tunnels that the Chinese dug, right? Back in the 1800s, the Chinese, not so tall. Moose going in their cave, not so smart, okay? <laughs> Wear a hard hat for a reason. But the California leaf knows bat, another one of our, you know, I don't know if you heard, there's a really nasty disease going through our bat population across North America right now. It's, gonna, it's like the bee syndrome. Anybody ever kept up with the bees? You know what happens with the bees? It's really a, not a good thing. And the California leaf-nosed bat was in real major problems. Now, photographs. Before I showed up, there were no photographs of them hanging around. Why not hanging around? Joke. Get it? Anyway. There was no photographs. Why? Because these bats do not like white light. The California leaf-nosed bat is very sensitive. You had to go in there with this very dark red filter. And it took about five, eight minutes for our eyes to adjust just to see in that. They don't like the white light. So I had to go in there again using photographic tools to get the photograph. Well, how do you find them? AF illuminator on the flash, okay? So I would hold the button, I'd paint the wall so I saw the one I want that be, you know, that photograph I, I desire. I let the camera sit there and focus for me. Then I go with the flash and they can't see flash, okay? The duration of the flash is way too fast. It doesn't even bother their, their perceptions at all. And I get the shots. The biologists never had photographs of them in the caves until I showed up because they couldn't do it because you can't hold a flashlight on them. So it's those problem solving techniques that is what's always set me apart and, and why I do projects. California gnat catcher, another endangered critter. People had photographed it before I showed up, but they hadn't done it the same way and they hadn't done it as intensively. This is back in the, still in the days of film. And you know, this picture you just saw, all that, it's gone. It's now blacktop. It's the San Joaquin uh, Hills toll road. So when you go out and photograph a subject, and you realize it's going to be gone. Seriously, paved over. Talk about photographic pressure, right? Still using the same basic tools I learned from my backyard. On this photograph here, it was cropped by the magazine, but this is the last full um, magazine wrap, the Audubon cover wrap that Audubon did, and they used this shot. And I point it out because it has bands on those legs. I didn't particularly put these bands on. I, I am a master bander, but um, a lot of photographers tend to avoid those kind of things, but it's so important, especially for a population that is, was especially back then, almost on the edge of blinking out. Another word for extinction. Now, I don't want you to think that I have a master plan. I wish I was that intelligent, and I appreciate you giving me that credit, uh, uh, thought of uh, credibility, but it don't work that way. And as long as you keep right foot, left foot, right foot, and you stay vertical, I think you're winning. <laughs> so in this case, had two little boys, and there was a bug fair in our town. And I'm like, I don't do bugs, really, okay? I just don't do bugs. Boys want to see the bugs. I don't want to go the bugs. Really, you should go, I don't want to go. An hour later at the bug fair, okay? <laughs> so we get there, and there's a presentation on this guy, the El Segundo Blue Butterfly. And I get there, and um, Rudy's back there, and he's talking about him. And I'm looking at these photographs. Here's a picture of my kit fox. Here's a picture of my kangaroo rat. Here's a picture of my gnat catcher. Pictures I just, some of the pictures I just showed you. They're on the screen. I'm like, wow. And uh, what he did, like most biologists did back then, um, before the world of the web, is he saw a picture in the magazine. He took a picture of it, make a slideshow. So I got down to the end of the slideshow. I go, hey, those are some really good photographs. <laughs> and he said, yeah, they really are really good, aren't they? I go, yeah, thank you. And he sat there and looked at me. They're your pictures, aren't they? <laughs> he goes, am I in trouble? I said, that presentation was amazing, you know, but let's get you some dupes so that my images look really better on the screen. I said, because, you know, your, your message is just right on. I can't help but support that 100%, which is what I do still to this day. And uh, he said, well, you know, I want to make it up to you. I want you to come down to my site. And I want you to photograph some butterflies. I'm going, oh, thank you. And... Uh, <laughs> So that spring, we go down to photograph the Elskunda blue butterfly. Now, this butterfly, just so you understand, um, 
it lives literally at the end of the LAX runway. So here's the runway, here's the butterfly, here's Pacific Ocean. They're on this. So the first thing I do, I get out of the car, he gives me my, a hard hat. I'm like, what, are these butterflies like vicious, you know? <laughs> hard hat? Put it on, he goes, no, no, because, and he took me around the, the shack they have there, and here's, here's engine cowlings and wing flaps and s wrenches, stuff that falls off the planes when they take off, right? You know the thing that flew me out here yesterday, you know? <laughs> And I'm like, holy, okay. So he showed me that, and we're walking around, and he goes, by the way, have you ever heard of the, the Palace Verde Blue Butterfly? I said, well, yeah, it's extinct. And he goes, it was until yesterday. I rediscovered them. I said, really? He goes, I want to see how, if you're an okay guy. He said, you seem okay, so let's go photograph them. Oh, yeah, let's do that, right? <laughs> I don't do bugs, right? So it's a 10-minute drive, and we're going to, our, to a piece of property, and in those 10 minutes, I went back to what I learned from my own backyard. I asked some questions. What kind of plant do they feed on? How do I identify it? What can I, I, can I know about it that I can use in biology to get close physically? It's the size of your thumbnail, okay? It's not a big butterfly. And I'm photographing in Los Angeles. Lots of smog, right? So sun going through smog gives you orange things, okay? This is the Palos Verde blue butterfly, okay? Not orange. That means I gotta use a macro. I gotta use flash fill. I gotta find the deer plants. And more importantly, I'm going to a spot that's a piece of property that's owned by the Department of Defense. It's our major, major fuel depot. So I've had security clearance since day one. So I get on the base, he shows me the slope where these guys live. And he's told me about them. And here's a female, and there's on the deer plant. I got about two hours to spend with them. That's it. And he found maybe, a, maybe eight or nine adult males the day before. That's not a whole lot of time for something this size to find in the coastal sage scrub, which is like this. It's moving with the coastal breeze. So I'm sitting there. I'm shooting away, shooting away. I'm looking, I'm looking. I'm getting stuff like this. And this is a female. I ain't going to do diddly squat, OK? It's, it's, it's photographically. It's boring. It's not tack sharp. Lots of issues. And I'm there because I'm a problem solver. I'm there because I can make a difference. So I'm watching this, this slope, and, and typical, I've parked at one plant, OK? One that I can access without tromping anything down. I've taken my lens. I focus down to half life size. That so means I have to move the camera back and forth to actually focus the subject. It's faster than anything else I can do. I can come in with the flash, flash fill, take a picture. This is down for the days of the F4 and the SB, what were they, the SB24 back then, F4? So anyway. Sitting there, and I'm taking these pictures, and, and there's one male. You know, I only saw one other male, and he was. Whoosh, they're fast. They're 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 a fast flyer when you look at the description form because they are they're just. Whoosh. This one male lands in the flower. I bend over, and I take five frames. Whoosh, whoosh. I'm shooting a camera that shoots eight frames per second. So how much time do I actually have with this butterfly? I got five frames. So then, drive back home, put the film in the lab, get it processed. A couple hours later, I'm looking at the pictures. Yeah. Trash, out of focus, right? I only had maybe maybe three rolls, four rolls of pictures. I'm skunked. That's the way it works, right? But the pressure's on. So then I'm coming through and I go, oh, what about that happened that last you know mail I had just before I left? And I'm going through the first frame, out of focus. Second frame, psh, not so good. Get to the third frame. Okay, on a really bad day, we could get it to push. Get to the fourth frame, number 77 in the file. I get this shot of a mail. And I'm like, wow, it's sharp, okay? I know I'm not really like thrilled with all the elements, but it's like it's not been photographed before. It's been, you know, considered extinct. I sit there and get some prints made, and they're only flying uh, as an adult. Their window's like 12, 14 days. Okay, so they come up, psh, fly, 14 days later, they're gone. Okay, <laughs> basic bug life. Well, I get down the go down the next week. Rudy, Rudy and I are going to go down one more time. It's not like I could just camp there. I mean, it's Department of Defense. It's not like they just say, oh, photographer, come on in, spend a week. <laughs> so I get down to the base, and this is the days when I had a 71 uh, uh, Camaro. With a 350, I built myself a six pack, so everybody knew I was coming, okay? <laughs> That's just what I did back then. I pull up to the main gate, and I see the colonel for the base in, in full dress. I'm like, really? And I get past the gate, go around the bend, and here's the CNN, the NBC, the ABC, all the news affiliate trucks, satellite mi microwave towers are up. I'm like, what the? And I park, and Rudy comes over, and he goes, 
hello. And I said, hey, uh, I thought it was just the two of us. He goes, no, we're having a news conference today. <laughs> I'm like, say what? Make a long story short, I had a couple of five by sevens I'd made. And I just pull them out just, just like this to give them to Rudy and poof, they're gone. Within a week, it had been published, or within a month, I should say, it was published over 110 times worldwide. And why I made big news and kind of what brings back what I do is there's two guys there in black suits. They really kind of stood out and they're kind of off the, on the edge, you know, in a black sedan kind of thing. And I was like, it really bugged me all day long. And they were watching me like a hawk. And I'm like, okay, you know, what is it? So I finally asked and he goes, well, those are two people from the Clinton administration. I said, say, say why are they here? Well, about a couple of weeks ago, Clinton raided the Heritage Fund for the Palace for the New Butterfly. And I said, what? Well, there's a, there's a Heritage Fund, and when a species goes extinct, all the money that was there, it's all kind of, in a nutshell, kind of stuff. But basically, that money is put aside. In case it ever comes back, they can actually kind of enact an emergency kind of recovery program real fast. Well, that money had just gone poof. And then the bug says, I'm here. <laughs> so kind of thing I do. So in photography, I moved on. I started moving from film, like with the coastal gnat catcher, and I started getting into digital. Okay? And, and digital started opening up this, this, this real world of photography. The big first thing is I wasn't limited to 36 frames. Okay? That was the worst thing. You hit frame 37, and then you go, I don't want to see what I'm missing, as the film goes, you know? Okay? That was worse. So digital. Whole bunch of problems came through in digital before even knew, you guys knew digital was around. I mean, if you Google, you can find these, these things about Moose Peterson being a heretic and be the, he's going to be the death of wildlife photography because I talk about digital. I like those prophecies. They worked out so well. <laughs> okay, so I started working with the, the coastal gnat catcher, uh, uh, cactus wren, another endangered critter. I started doing digital work. And then I went back to my, my good friend, the um, giant kangaroo rat, where I could sit there and work at night. This is shot with a 14. I'm up close, a single flash up high. That's how I get the dramatic shadow. And then because of digital, I could sit there and get that little bit of glow in the background. And I started getting instant, like, OK, you know what it is. On the LCD, you're using flash. You go, that works, that works. Oops, delete. OK, and you learn what you're doing right there. So then I start pushing that photographic envelope. I started going, what can I do more? So I, I sat there, and this is the, the Santa Cruz kangaroo rat. Uh, in a place where I still can't tell you where it lives, a uh, very, very secretive spot. But I can tell you that it's now extinct. Uh, but it's, you can see the original digital camera. I came back there and I would get, and I still get calls for a thing called record of life. A critter has been found, it's been thought to extinct or it's, it's not been seen for a long time. And I'm there to do one thing and record that it actually existed on the planet, which is really, in one aspect, a real compliment. On the other side, it's really depressing knowing that we are photographing isn't going to be around, and they are gone. Um, when we did this particular um, uh, suicide run to go do this, we only caught 13 individuals, which I guess should have been the, 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 the hint that they were going to blink out on us. But this was the start of digital, of, of actually starting to take photography beyond just the record and start telling stories. Now, back again to my, my project, my Kit Fox project, which I, you know, I'll be back in a couple weeks with them again. They're just, a, I, I'm there all the time recording, and what I do is record the life history of these critters. That's the goal. The, question, the, the problem is you can't do that in a week. You can't do that in a month. And like this one here has been 26 years, okay? So I'm in a sump in Bakersfield, California. It's a very, was historically a very wet spot. They make these big holes in the ground so the surface water can kind of pool there so people can have homes. Same time, people throw their garbage in there, the lawn chairs, their couches. It's like this disposable spot in lovely Bakersfield, California, which has its own color spectrum because of all the oil wells. It's not, you can't go out and say 5,500 Kelvin or any of those regular numbers. Uh-uh, okay? It's weird. But I'm sitting in the sump. I'm sitting in two inches of water. It's 102, 103 degrees. Lovely place, you might think, for a romantic wildlife interlude, right, for photography. And I'm photo looking at a hole in the wall. And the fuzz heads pop out. Now the fuzz heads, that's a, that's a salmon keen pup. And they're called fuzz heads when they first emerge. And these guys is about three and a half weeks old, maybe almost four weeks old. And they first emerge. They've never been seen before and let alone been photographed. And there I was. I'm in there with a D1 with a 4028. And I'm sitting there photographing this hole first coming out, first emerging out of the den. That's one of the things that I, 
I'm fortunate I get to do is I get to sit somewhere on my butt and just look. And biologists love me because they don't have that luxury anymore. They're out there collecting data. They don't have the ability just to sit and watch. Now, everything I do and I collect scientifically is all anecdotal. It's not something that's been you know, looked at for a long time. It's something that I can repeat. But it's hard to argue with a photograph. That's the flip side. So I sat there and I photographed this guy. And I'm doing it. And I'm photographing him. And there's a female. You can see the telemetry on her, on her neck, that, that black line that's going by her ear, the pup. Well, um, last year, I photographed what it would have been. It, the pup is the grandma. So I photographed her daughter's daughter's den last year. Um, so I've been with these guys that long. And that night, I got back to the hotel. Uh, this has been 2000. Took these photographs. I'm emailing them to biologists around the globe. And they go, when did you take these pictures? I said, this morning. No way. How'd you do that? It's a thing called digital photography. That's how biologists got into it instantly. Because the instant news, the instant getting the word out there, the telling the story in a photograph, poof, okay, did it all. In this case, that telemetry female, she raised a, a successful brood with that collar, which back then was new technology, and it didn't interfere with the basic going-ons of their life. That was big news in 2000. So digital was like, hey, it was here. So I continued to move on. I, you know, the California least tern is another amazing bird. It's about the size of a little bit bigger than a robin, um, a very endangered critter. Photographing these guys, and this is the one place where I do use a blind, is in a tern colony. Because terns use two means of defense against predators. And photographers, are, I'm afraid, are in that predator category with them. Two things. First is they dive down, they kind of like hit you in the head. The other thing is they like to crap on you. <laughs> okay? You notice what the male's got in his mouth? That's a fish. So the stuff coming out the other side, smelly. Okay? So I use a blind not to hide, except from the whitewash. Well, in this case, this blind I'm in, and it's a pretty good sized blind. You know, there's, there's room, I guess it's room for, I guess, three of us technically, but it's my own, it's just myself. But on the outside, <laughs> receiving that love from the turns, were two military police, okay, on either side to make sure my lens was pointed in one direction. This is, down, this is down at Camp Pendleton Marine Base, and they were doing amphibious training that day. So on the other side of this, oh, I'm going to say like 50, 80 feet out there, there's green men with green clothes and green vehicles running up and down the beach. So there's times this, the, the lens would be like this, because the tanks would be going by. So right off the bat, one of the basics you have to learn along that technique is important. The same time telling the story, OK? Turns, they eat fish, they not out in the ocean, I gotta get the backside. They bring that fish in, they give it to the kid, and the kid swallows it. That's why his crop is kind of pudged out. But more important to the story is the kids are living on that hot beach. You look in the, in the foreground in the left corner out of focus is one of the kids there. Okay, underneath that little bit of shade, sand's really hot. Chicks are real fragile. So this, you know, ah kind of moment, that's how people see this. And that's what I wanted to do, because I'm in the heart street pulling business. I want to go out there and reach and grab the heart string of the viewer. And then if I do that, they'll hopefully read the caption. And they read the caption, hopefully they'll read the story, and then hopefully they'll get involved. Well, to get this awe moment, I had to know that after they get the fish, the kids go up to the parents and they rub on their chest because it just dove in the ocean, and that breast holds that water, and that cool water cools down the chicks so they can survive on the hot sand knowing the subject, okay? All these lessons from my backyard have always paid off in the projects. Now, I do a number of projects out in the middle of nowhere, okay? And doll sheep is one of these, I love sheep. Sheep are an amazing critter. You know, they, just, they just boggle my mind what they do. And these are up in the Yukon Territory, up in Canada. Every day we would walk up this talus slope that was frozen. It was minus 10 was the average temperature uh, during the day. We had on our back survival gear, so if anything happens, if weather closed in, we could stay on the mountain and survive during the night. And up we go every day. Um, this is one of those, I do a lot of these things that just really aren't for sane people, point blank, okay? This is just like crazy stuff. And I think about it today, I'm like, what was I thinking? I wasn't, that's the problem. And I climb up, and again, with, with two biologists from the Alaska Fish and Game Department, the one guy had done his doctoral on doll sheep. And we're in November, which is supposed to be what? The rut, right? Well, 
we found out, and this trip is the one that finally you know, brought attention, was they, they don't select their mates in the fall, they do it in the springtime. And of course, when you walk up to these doll sheep, they go, you know what, you're so stupid, you can't be you know, dangerous, okay? <laughs> you can't be. And so they just walk up and they, just, they walk around us, they did their thing, and, and oh God, it's such a beautiful place up there, it's just gorgeous. And then I just spent the day, it's all the 4028 with a D1H, and I'm just up there just watching. And back then, the D1 family, bless their hearts, had a battery issue. You know, you get like three clicks and the battery go, right? So in my survival pack, I'd had extra batteries. I had hand warms to keep them going. So I could work all day in this environment. Because it's not like you're going to go down that hill to that van because you forgot your battery and come back up. I mean, once I went up each day, that's where I stayed. And I sat there and I worked the situation. I worked the photographs and get the photographs that would bring the story back to the biologist. You know, the dominant male scaring off the kids from the, the uh, female who even though it was selected in the springtime, the impregnation is done in the fall and then it's delayed uh, implantation in, in, the, in the uterus so the kids, the lambs, aren't born till the next spring. So all that's part of the process of going out and doing this. Now, how do I learn about dealing with batteries in the cold? I live in the Sierras. I took my camera, I stuck it outside and saw what happened. And I look at the battery thing, I go, not so good. And then I go out and I find a solution. I stick it outside in the cold. Not so good. Until I found the solution. Before I lived in the Sierras, when I lived on the coast, I stick the camera in their freezer and their refrigerator in a bag. Okay? Finding solutions to problems is what you do. That way when you're out there shooting, and this is something I, I, no matter what the subject is, I want to concentrate on the subject the entire time. As soon as I remove my eye from that subject, I lose. The picture's not going to be there. It's Murphy's Law of nothing else, right? So all the variables between shutter speed, f-stop, exposure compensation, battery consumption, all of those things, they are completely tested before I go out shooting. And they're not only tested, but the results that work are implanted in that little brain of mine. I got about a 10-minute buffer. You know, so something about 15 minutes ago was already pushed out. Now something new's in there. I kind of work like that, OK? It's part of the process. So when I went up uh, in April many years ago, up to the Hall Road. If you watch that uh, Hall Road trucker thing on Discovery, okay, <laughs> right? But this is the Hall Road. I mean, it is a nasty road, and it goes from Fairbanks all the way up to Prudhoe Bay. It's the most incredible landscape. It's not as dangerous they make it out to be, but yeah, you do lose windshields, you do pop tires, but it's just a road, you know, and there's truckers up there, and they go by. Well, we went up there for one reason. I started learning this thing called about climate change and climate warming. And Sharon and I have fought for, for decades to, ser to save little patches of California, little spots of habitat where Pacific uh, pocket mouse might live or where certain clapper rail might live. Our little pieces of, of our wild heritage is very endangered. And to save that little piece for them. Well, the climate change, that little piece that we, we, we fought for 12, 14 years to preserve, just a five degree change in temperature and that piece of property is no longer any good for that critter. So this came on the radar scheme for a lot of us long before it got in the news. So I wanted to go up and understand what's going on. Now the musk ox, okay, went extinct in Alaska back in the early 1900s. They brought in some and they're doing pretty well, then they kind of went down and right now they're, they're so-so. And I wanted to, to see what these guys are like because up in Alaska in the Arctic where a lot of things are changing quicker on the environment especially when it comes to climate change. So these guys, musk ox, the first thing is the ox. You might think there's some big bison kind of thing. Man, they're, they're, these, tea, these tea tables up here, okay, a little bit bigger than they are. They're small little guys, the little things, they're not like what you think of. The, the, you know, they're the ones that you know, they circle their young when they're threatened. I haven't seen that yet. I've seen photographs of it, but I just have to assume that the people doing it must have just like had shotguns and going around like cowboys to make them do that kind of thing because they're, they're pretty mellow. They have this incredible thick fur. I mean, and that fur um, is what keeps them around. You gotta realize what today is the, the 8th of December, so they've been in total darkness 24 seven now for uh, what, 18 days, 19 days? No sunlight, right? And it's probably, uh, I haven't came up, I imagine it's about minus 20. Okay, I'll get colder than that. Um, just down the road, it's got the world record at minus 20, 122. So it gets cold up there. So this fur, this really thick fur, 
back then was about $60 an ounce because of, of its qualities, keeps them going. I mean, because it gets nasty. It's minus 32 uh, when this thing is snowing. And they doesn't stop. They just keep on button heads and making babies. And, and I was up there for the calves. The calves should have been dropped right then. And as it turned out, two days after I left, the first calves were, were, were dropped. Because it's amazing. Minus 32, and they're giving birth to little kids. And those little kids come out. And it's not like somebody you know, puts them in an incubator and keeps them warm inside. It's like, hello, welcome to the world. And it's just an amazing part of it. And the fur, the fur is so insulating that the snow just kind of cakes on them because the heat doesn't get out. Anybody remember the old Adams family? Yeah, President. So the story is that Sherwood was in the LA uh, Zoo and saw that ass, and that's how it was formed. Okay? <laughs> that's the story. And that's what these guys live on. This stuff is about this tall. Okay? It's not even an inch. That's what they live on. I don't know how they do it. Females have a, not as big a horn. Males have the bigger ones. And this is last year calves. It's not the current one. And their face is absolutely amazing. Um, and photographically, you just look at the tonalities in that fur, and it's like, i got to photograph it. I, you know, that's, what, that's what I've done is, is, is all this 30 years. Is there's a, something I go, that's something that needs my attention. That's a subject I need to go work on. Minus 32, that's all I was wearing. Um, I don't get cold. It's just one of those things in life. I just don't get cold. And so working in the Arctic seems to work out pretty well. I do get hot, but I don't seem to get cold. And what I've done over and over again, I go out and do these projects. Then I come back to my main project. There's a Kid Fox family coming out, camera on, on a remote. This is literally in a field between uh, State Farm Insurance and this big castle of real estate folks there in, in Bakersfield. It's a vacant lot. There's a, there a congressman who said, you know what? The Salmon King Kid Fox is going to keep Bakersfield from ever growing. Man, that town is nothing but expanded, and the Kid Fox has gotten less, less and less and less. Now, this is one of the, there's a golf course in the background, and around the golf course are all these homes with these retirees, and uh, they love their foxes to the point where, and I ain't making this up, okay, they, the Kid Foxes have a, a circuit, because this guy puts out chicken for the foxes, this guy cooks out eggs, this guy puts out raw meat. They, they walk the homes in the backyards, and this guy home, puts out these eggs. And the reason why I went and get these shots, the biologist I work with always gives the kid fox white golf balls. And they just love the golf balls. They grab it and they go over and they bury it. And that goes back to before we showed up, this is a massive marsh area down there in Bakersfield. And these guys were stealing what? Bird eggs. And they were cashing them. And that basic biology is still there. They go after the golf balls. They don't know they don't hatch, obviously. <laughs> But this guy puts out hard-boiled eggs, and I had to get the photograph. Well, look at it photographically. It should be a simple, clean shot, and that's the goal. But there's flash fill, okay, matching the ambient light with the fill light, and sitting there, and it's a tripod on the ground, close-up lens, getting the shot. So all these are still going back to techniques and things I tried out in my own backyard. Now, the polar bear is in trouble. Point blank. No matter, you can't argue it. Um, when you have constantly, you know, we, uh, I must say there's three or if not four carcasses found on the Alaska coast this year drowned because they could not swim far enough to get to land. You know that we have a problem with, with warming up there. Now, I, I personally don't do anything on the Hudson Bay. I, I'm not into that environmental disaster. Everything I'm doing is up in the Beaufort Sea, up in the, the coast of the Alaska, up in the Arctic Ocean. And this is a, a whale carcass. And I went up there, and, and just so you understand, no matter your good intentions, things sometimes don't work out. Because I thought I was going to go up there and shoot during the daytime. The week before, my good friend Joel Satori had been up there, and he was shooting, had no problem. Got up there on the first day, and I got that, got that one shot on the carcass when we first landed. And then, uh, long story short, the bears were harassed to the point they wouldn't come back during the day. So I'm like, wow. So I thought we'd go out at night and shoot them. Well, I didn't think I was going to be photographing polar bears nocturnally, right? It's just not, you think of polar bear photography, you don't say, oh, this is time for Joe McNally Flash World, right? <laughs> um, so I had one flash, okay? And it came to flash, I had one, those little itty bitty AAA battery flashlights. That's all I had with me, because I wasn't going to be working at night. I mean, it's cold, it's the Arctic, you know? Well, guess what? I had to make do. So all this is done with one flash. Uh, headlights from the van uh, were used at times to light things up. 
and I was outside the van at nighttime with my one little AAA flashlight looking for eye shine coming up to me. Uh, the one cub you see on the ground, he was a pain in the ass, okay? Mom, okay, and that's a big piece of blubber there because that kid, you know, they'd be out there. You could kind of see him moving around, kind of ghost-like. And at one point, we had up to 13 at one time in the carcass. And we're on the van. That little kid, you know, would come up. I could see him barely. And we had him many times at contest where he'd sit there and he'd come up and I'd get into the van and he'd thump on the, the uh, stand up on his hind legs and close the door like, now stay in there. And I'd sit there and I'd watch him go away, you know, and I'd come back out to shoot. So I'm down on one knee because I, I don't want to be shooting down on him, right? Because I want to make him look big and massive. That means I need to shoot up on him, which means I have to be down on my knee, which means I have to be outside, not in a van. And he'd sit there and, you know, he's one of the big males. And he'd sit there and he'd, He'd see me outside, and then all of a sudden he'd, boom! You know, we did that many times over the evenings to get the shots. So I go do a project, and I'm back to my friends, the Kit Fox. You know, that I, the, all these projects get repeated. I, I don't just do a project and go away. That's my, my specialty, is to go out and understand. I work with biologists who have always been the key to my success. Um, they're my eyes, they're my ears, they're my, the, the, the people tell me where I need to be. Back again to the coastal gnat catcher, uh, working on another tow roll project. And just so you understand, when you're a photographer, and you have kind of two responsibilities. One is to get the photograph. That's the first responsibility. The second one is sharing that photograph. But here's the caveat with that sharing. You put out the photographs that work, okay? The ones that are out of focus, up the ass, you know, not so complimentary. You don't put those out there. Now people say, all I see are your great images. And I said, correct. <laughs> okay, and it's really important. I have a paper I wrote long ago, and it's about photographing the ugly people. One thing about wildlife, there are some individuals that are just disgusting, okay? Ugly, raggedy, you know, they got blood and guts, they're missing feathers, hunks of fur, whatever it is. Those photographs aren't really out there. They don't grab heartstrings. You can do them like a presentation right now, you're telling a story, but be selective, because otherwise you get skunked, okay? <laughs> if you don't think about it, you always come back skunked. There's always something to, get to photograph, even though not the prime subject, but you gotta sit there and think about it. So another project that I worked on, this is one of those, those really heartache ones. I had three days to tell a whole life story of the Atwater, Atwater Prairie Chicken. Um, at the time, there was less than 20 individuals on the planet. This is a bird that, in 1900, there was a million of them, okay? And I went out there, and I, luckily, again, the biologist, Terry, had me at the right place at the right time. And, and it's not a place that anybody can just go and photograph them. It's, it's behind lock gates for a very good reason. And, I, you know, the males that kind of did their thing, sort of. There's only three males displaying. Uh, that's because there's so few females. And seriously, um, grouse, any of the grouse family, they're the M&Ms out there of the, of the natural world. You know, they're gonna, they're gonna lay 12, 14 eggs knowing that if they're really lucky, one will make it to this first year. That's why there's a million of them, because they, every year, if you think about it, there's gonna be at least a million raised, okay? So percentage-wise, enough will be out there to keep on going, but when there's less than 20, these guys are really, really critical. Now, the sad thing about these guys, the reason why I got the photograph of this nest is the mom and all the females, well, all of them have telemetry, but the females have telemetry so they know when it's, they're on eggs. It's a very active, hands-on management program. And this female, during the night, was killed by a, a northern harrier. So they had to go out and rescue these chicks. They were brought back in, kept warm, and then they were put back and released back out in the wild. Now, the current population is about 40 in the wild. And we're talking about massive hands-on work between the wild population and the uh, fossil rim, the captive program to raise these chicks to keep them going. So I had three days to tell the whole story to get it done, not only for the Fish and Wildlife Service, but for uh, a magazine. And there are projects that I do that are very personal. Um, California lost its last grizzly bear in 1924. And we had many different subspecies of grizzly bear in California. Uh, we had one that worked as a flock, or as a herd, I should say, a flock. A herd, and they'd go around from the acorn trees eating acorns. Can you imagine uh, today uh, 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 a herd of grizzly bears coming at you? <laughs> People would just, they'd fall over, right? We had one group that, the uh, species that would just work on whale carcasses that would wash up. 
Well, that piece of the California puzzle, my native state where I work all the time, was missing. That's what first got me going into grizzly bears in the 80s. And a couple of places a lot of people go for grizzly bears now are areas that I, I originally opened up. I was the first one there. Kind of like Bosque. Artie and I were the first ones to go to Bosque back in the 80s. Now it's a place uh, that today, in this very moment, is a, an incredible explosion. Well, McNeil River, you know, we again packed a couple of things as normal. Um, we're going to go up and uh, again got in a plane. Uh, so I've been working in planes long before I was passionately photographing warbirds. And we flew over to McNeil River. It's a spot where you, they allow four people in at a time. It's by permit or by lottery only. Um, and you only get to be there four days. That's the entire you know McNeil encampment, uh, the cook shack and the biologist shack, uh, and that's it. That's where we. This is 1 a.m. in the morning. It's in July, and it's it's just Shangri-La. I mean, there's no cell. There's no there's no nothing there. There's no electricity. It's just you and the and the bears, and it's the bears' world. Uh, we're strictly a visitor. Typical thing, Alaska, it's raining, don't make a difference. The only thing that was kind of unique this trip is that we had this indoor shelter, this is the cook shelter where you could stay warm. Um, and in this trip I had my first uh, flare up or first uh, inkling with uh, the flesh eating disease that I, I now have, thanks for the bird photography. So I was kind of limited in my emotion, but this is a spectacular place where every day, and my doctor said I can go there with my flesh eating disease, but I wasn't supposed to be on my foot, I wasn't supposed to scratch it, and I couldn't get it warm. I didn't tell him I was going to walk four, day, four miles every day in hip boots. We just kind of left out a discussion, um, which five days later it totally bloomed to, to the nasty stuff you think about. So you walk two miles up. Luckily, uh, again, family fair, my wife, uh, who up to this point had never camped with grizzly bears, kind of thought it was like, no, not the smartest thing to do. Uh, now she can't get enough of it because it's not what you think. Uh, they live in these grasses, they get pop up in the sedge flats, and you gotta realize this is a thousand pound, no, no, this is a 900 pound female. And the majority of the weight she's gaining is from those grasses. That big hump on their back is for pulling up grasses and, 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 and roots and stuff. That's where they get a lot of their fat. That's, they're just, eating, they're like cows, you can hear them grazing and crunching. So you walk past the ones in the sedge flats, and you get past um, Gibby Creek, you walk over the ridge, and. Luckily, Jake was there. He's carrying a lot of stuff for Dad. And you get to McNeil River Falls. And what you're seeing there is a little pad. That's, that's our spot, that little piece of dirt. That's where we stay, and the bears don't have to come in. The rest of it's theirs. Uh, the lady there, sweet lady, uh, Rachel, is, uh, is the DA at, uh, at Wasilla. And uh, at the time, her boss was a, a lady named uh, Palin. So we heard a lot of stories about her boss. And uh, Alaska laws dictates that the biologists carry that shotgun. Um, it doesn't say it has to be loaded. Um, there, there are no shells in there because it's useless. Okay, you go to Alaska and it's got this. You go to the fish game office. It's got this big ass poster. A dead center of the poster is a grizzly bear, and there's all these positions around that. If you know, if you're here in relation to the bear, with one bullet, where you have to hit the bear to kill it, right? Come here, bear. Okay, don't work. So much better is knowing basic biology. They're here for this river, they're here for the salmon. We sit on a little platform. I have a GPS all the time um, recording that metadata that goes to the biologist, photographing the, the, the bears. And it's a goober. Uh, what's a goober? A three to four year old bear that just got kicked out by mom, okay? And they, they're, they're scared of their own shadows. They just don't know how they're gonna get around in life. They're called goobers because they do some stupid stuff, okay? <laughs> they just do lots of stupid stuff. They're so afraid. This particular guy, and I don't remember his name, I'm afraid, and they all have a name because they have no ear tags. So the only way they can talk about individuals is they have to name them. But this guy here is a goober who is in the number three spot. So it means someday he's going to be one of these big guys because he's figured out the key to success to work with these big ones. Now, the big ones, um, this is um, Elvis. And Elvis is about 1,200 pounds. Okay? And, he's, and you can see the force of that river hitting him, and he's not moving. That's just muscle, okay? Here's Donnie, really blonde hair, you know, and he would, he's just walking up the side. And we're talking about getting close, okay? We get close to wildlife. They stay outside that little dirt patch, we stay outside their little green area. And there's a little observation point I'll show you here in a second that's below that I couldn't get with my, my ankle. But Jake and I are up there shooting the 600s, and you spend the whole day watching life. And the life is how these grizzly bears survive. And the first thing you're going to learn real quickly is, one, they don't care about us, okay? 
We, they, just, they just don't care about humans. It's real simple. We fall apart real quickly when a bear hits us. It's like we just go, okay? So it's not much to be scared of, and they're not being shot, so they just do their thing, and we do our thing. And it's, it's an amazing, you know, 12 hours to sit there and watch them. Because most people say a grizzly bear, oh, it's got to be scary. And they look at this picture, they go, he must be growling. And this is the first thing he tells you he's not happy. That's all it is. And it's a big yawn. Nothing more than a big yawn. And they have a very complex facial disc. And that facial disc allows them to say, I'm OK, you're not OK, get out of the way. Because this is what grizzly bears do most of the time. Okay? This is their specialty. They are truly the world's greatest couch potatoes. <laughs> they have one thing on their mind, going back to sleep in their den. To get there, they have to get fat. How do you get fat? Eat lots of calories and do nothing, right? And you might be saying, well, gee, Moose, I never remember seeing an article in any magazine or anything of yours about grizzly bears. That's because the truth about grizzly bears is boring, okay? <laughs> this is what they do, okay? This guy here sat there and he spent the whole afternoon just watching bald eagles. That's all he did. <laughs> That's all he did. How many words does it take to say boring, right? Okay? This is what grizzly bears do. Okay? Now, yeah, here's a confrontation. And I'm sure you've seen some of the videos that of, of, of the bears c confronting each other. That happens, but that's not what they do. They're sitting there, they're trying to get the fish the easiest possible way. Because the less calories they put out and the more they take in, the fatter they get so they can go to sleep. Now, this is our favorite bear. This is Dusty. You can tell Dusty, he's got that, in the very lower left corner, you can see that one little claw that's kind of black and shriveled up. That's how they knew he was Dusty. Dusty was an amazing bear, okay? That's Dusty, and that's the lower platform. That's Sharon, she's about 12 feet away from Dusty, okay? And that's where he was. That's the number two spot for catching fish. They'd come up that water, and they try to jump. They couldn't do it so well, they hit a rock, and they kind of go, and they kind of be, the fish would be dazed, and Dusty would go out, and just step on him. He's got a fish. That's all he had to do. He didn't have to wiggle. He, didn't, he just sat there, just kind of stepped on him. That's how you get to be 1,200 pound Dusty. That's how you get to sleep in the number two spot, okay? He has to be, a, you know, he's got a couple scars, but otherwise he's really clean. He's just one badass bear. And, you know, this is what we did a lot of times. We sat there and looked at sleeping bears, okay? <laughs> these sleeping bears, the thing that's always kind of amazed me, these big mud flats out there, the um, Cook Inlet has the second biggest tidal influence on the planet. So that, that tide goes up and down um, at the most 22 feet. We weren't there then, it was about 14, 15 vertical feet. When the tide goes out, these mud flats, these bears are out there like crazy. Now here's a, here's a 900, ton or a pound, 900 to 1,000 pound sow, and she's out there getting these clams. They're about this long. And they can pop them open with those big long nails, and they don't even break the shell. You think about it, that big old bear, you can see that it's about pulling one of the, the clams out there. They go the energy to, to get a clam, that's because all the calories are coming in for like nothing going through the mud. Amazing these big bears have that gentleness about them, and they do. Um, they're just an amazing critter. So McNeil, up in Alaska. I spent a lot of time up there, you know, that thing called climate change, getting involved with that whole thing. So a couple of years ago, um, well, it would have been four years ago. This is the D2XS, so that would be four years ago. I'm sorry, I date photographs by the camera I shot them with, okay? <laughs> it's, you know, some people use their kids, I think camera models, all right? So D2XS, 600 of the 1.4. And this is number six, and this is a collared pika. Now, a collared pika is about the size of a tennis ball. Very small little animal. And Haley was doing it uh, 53 years ago. Um, this biologist did a survey of all the collared pikas in the, in the world, which is from the Yukon all the way up into Alaska. For you, it'd be like this, okay? And he went through and he sampled all the, the population. Sample means he goes out and, okay, brings back the skin and the bones. Well, Haley said, She's getting her PhD. I wonder if anything's changed. She went out and looked, and she sampled the entire population. And in 53 years, okay, two things had happened. The entire population went up a meter and a half in elevation, so they live a little bit higher on the mountains, and a little bone in their head changed. And they did that without email or faxes or smartphones or anything. And if you know anything about evolution, it don't work that fast, okay? This is all in response to climate change. 
uh, they had to go up high because of, well, what the collar pica does, it goes out in the summertime, it lives in these tall slopes, big rocky boulder slopes, you know, and uh, it goes out to the edge and then grabs the, the forbs and they bring those grasses and all those forbs back and they make hay piles out of them. And those hay piles dry in the, sand, in the sun and then once they're all dry and cured, they stash them in the rocks because right now, you know, they've been in total darkness like the muskox for 18, 19 days. And it's above the snow layer, layer it's minus 20, it gets to the, I think it's minus 80 is the, the lowest it goes for where they live. But they're still active. That snow, just the right amount of snow, is an insulation. So it's not that cold where they live. They have all these dry grasses. So they're doing their whole thing. Well, what happened is, with the climate change, that layer of snow to get the same insulating blanket, they had to go up on the mountain to get that. Well, number six, he was a character. We spent a lot of time with him. They do things like bay at the moon like a wolf, you know, they sit there and they call. And keep in mind, this is the size of a tennis ball, okay? They're small little dudes. And they're bouncing through these rocks like crazy. So I was there to get the photographs. And, and number six would go down to the, the grass you see in the, down there. And, and then he'd go up in the rocks and he had this, this, this path through the talus slope that he would go to get to where he was caching his stuff to make the hay piles. So Jake and I were up there. It's one of Jake's first project as a photographer. Our, our youngest son, he's actually the youngest American to ever have a, to be on a permit to handle endangered critters. So it's kind of in his blood to do it anyway. So we're up there photographing it for nine days and, and he's doing this thing and I'm learning their path. Well, one of the things that, you know, that was very unique was they went to get the shot of, of what they do and what it is to be called pica. And it looks like he's what, jumping the Grand Canyon here? But really it's, it's what, 18, 19 inches maybe going across there with those grasses? This photograph has gone around the planet. The prints of it hang in Yale and Harvard and Smithsonian, all these places. I'm, I'm well known for the flying pica shot. So working on this project and getting these, the, and what I'm doing is I'm collecting data. I'm just doing it photographically. That's the goal, that's my specialty, is understand the biologists enough that they tell me the stories, they give me the, the, the biological information I'm supposed to get, and I go out and I get the shots. So it's a very kind of a specialized thing. That, and these photographs, seriously, for most of the planet and most of the public, aren't important. To the people who are trying to make policy decisions and trying to save things from going extinct, they're critical. They're mission critical photographs. The number of times my photographs have been used in Congress blows away the number of times I've been published in magazines. So number six was really important, and, and Haley did an amazing job. Um, she's, she's, uh, what she's done with this population, what we know about uh, mammal, uh, small mammal science is amazing. Well, her um, major professor, how many people have a PhD, gone through that hill? Congratulations, you guys know what it is, okay? It's not too far from photography, where you know, a PhD, you have this hypothesis, and you have to sit there and go out and prove it, and then and have your peers say, yeah, you did prove it. Photography's kind of the same way. Okay, every time you make that click, it's like that PhD project all over again. Well, Lynx had, he said, hey, I got something for you. You like the color pike because you like being up in Alaska. So we landed in Fairbanks, and then we again drove up the Hall Road. I've, I've gone up the Hall Road, Hall Road so many times. I know I look back at my hand. There's some ice cream up there. It's amazing. amazing. Anyway, you go past the, North, the Yukon River, and that's important because the subject I'm going to go after only lives north of the Yukon River now. We're going way up on the slope. We're going so far up on that, that slope that the Brooks Range is what you see in the bottom right corner. And we go across the Brooks Pass, uh, Brooks Range through Attigan Pass. And we're going up, keep on moving up past, and we get to this mountain right here. And it's literally the last set of mountains before you hit the Arctic Plain. So north of that or above that, it's flat. It's the Arctic, okay? And that mountain just got its official name after we, just days after we left, and it's called Slope Mountain. So if you go and Google Slope Mountain and, 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 and you Google it for Alaska, you'll find it about 12 or 13 different times, okay? That's, I'm, I'm, I don't mind telling you because you'll never find it. There's so many slope mountains. And up there we went to photograph. In this project we worked on for about a year. We planned it for a year. It was going to be a three-week, you know, expedition to go up there. We, the time we actually went to do it because of politics and, and everything else, we only had three days to make this happen. And I'm going after, after something that had never been photographed before, literally, okay? Except for one thing, and that's a Palin story. I'm not going to go there, okay? Because <laughs> it, does, it doesn't count. So here's Slope Mountain. Now, the first thing the biologist said is the critter comes out when it's really warm and sunny, okay? It ain't warm and sunny, okay? So we've driven up there. Uh, it was a 10 hour, 11 hour drive. We get there. We're, we're, again, this is Slope Mountain. We're at the, the, the pipeline, which 
in itself is not, and for the environment, horrible. Prudhoe Bay for the environment, for itself, it's not horrible. But on the flip side, there's things they can do that can make it so environmental friendly and productive. It's, 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 it, everybody's got their lines in the sand and they would just kind of smear them out with their feet and kind of work on compromise. The whole world would work well, but I'm not gonna go in that speech. So up this hill we have to go, okay? <sighs> up the hill we have to go. That's like, what am I doing here, okay? This is not, this is another like going up for doll sheep. Here's the is, and the, the second guy from the right, so the first on the right is Jake. Next guy, Aaron, you know the TV show Survivor? He tried out and won, and he was supposed to be on that program, but he ends up canceling so he could come up and do his second season with the, the Marmot. So I'm gonna climb up mountains with a guy who won Survivor, okay? Seriously, stupid. So we're, we're camping literally underneath the pipeline, okay? Caribou are around, wolves are around. It's supposed to be a grizzly bear, we didn't see him. It's just Alaska, and it's the middle of nowhere. Satellite phones even work here. And you can see that sunny spot, Slope Mountain, ain't so sunny. So after the first night, you know we get our raft set up so we can get across to the mountain, get across the creek to get up to it. You know, go to bed, got a nice sun, or nice rainbow. Ugh, tomorrow's gonna be a good day to go out shooting. I wake up and there's clouds again, okay? That's Alaska, right? That's the norm. Slope Mountain is, 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 is just, it's raining, it's wet. Day one, the clock's ticking, got three days, gonna get the picture. So it's raining, Jake and I walk up that slope, and it was, seriously, why I'm here talking about it's beyond me. It's this, it's a 38 degree slope, it's talus, you take a step, slide back to, 600 is on my shoulder as I climb up this hill. The guys are gone, you know, and here's the old man way down there. Anyway, we get up there, we get on the spot where we know the marmots are. For five hours, Jake and I stay, stay hunkered over out in the open in the rain. Come back down, skunked. Meantime, biologists, they went past us way up the ridge because they're doing their survey work. And survey work for an animal that nobody knows anything about means you go out and you have to pop a couple. And that's the Alaska marmot. Um, it's not like the yellow belly marmot you might see like in Denali or in Yellowstone or in California. They're big. Okay, this thing's a big ass thing. It is the longest hibernator of any critter on the planet. Uh, there is almost nothing else known about it. It's totally not known except for the fact they're starting to go extinct and they're, they're trying to move north and there's nowhere else to go. Slope Mountain is the last spot if they can go north. So trying to understand them, which means looking at what uh, little parasites live on them, what's in their gut, where they eat, all these things are trying to, they're trying to find out the information. Why they use this methodology, it's called time and money. Time and money is everything in this business, okay? So we go out the second day, because I gotta get the photograph, because you know, one being prepped on the, on the table, don't quite cut it for the public. It's like, say this critter, as it's being splayed open <laughs> guts, or, you know, okay, don't work. So the next day, Okay, a little more, you know, promising. Oh man, there's the rain showers. We go up the hillside, in the rain, I get a couple shots of a marmot. Not really gonna change things, okay? Because this is how I spent the whole day, okay? Out in the open, in the rain, waiting things to happen. Now I'm using a 600, the 2X, very simple reason. There isn't much known about this critter. I can't do any homework. I, can't, I don't know what it's gonna do or how it's gonna react to this big person sitting on this rock out there when it pops out and looks at me, okay? Let alone camera noise, any noise that might come from any, um, anything I do, like a zipper on a bag. So I had to have as much physical reach as possible because I couldn't get close physically, which is such a big part of what I do as a photographer. So that day we got skunked, we were rained out again. So the next day, you know, that night, and then I'm saying that night, this is about probably, I'm gonna say like 1.30, 2 a.m., okay? Sun doesn't really go down. Next day, no threat of, of snow. So up the hill, Jake and I go again, okay? And we go up the hill to another burrow, okay? And we're up high, okay? And we've climbed up, climbed up. And now I'm parked on a rock, okay? You can see, the, you can see a big rig way down below the uh, NSF uh, big Arctic station. It's just off of, out of the frame on the left there. And there we sat. I mean, we're looking across at the helicopters that are sitting there from um, oil companies checking the pipeline. And after three hours, one finally pops out. <coughs> and after you get a couple clicks, okay, if an animal doesn't do any more, 
in my usual, I'm writing down information. I am collecting data because we're the first one to sit and watch and observe these guys do their thing. Four of them actually came out of the hole. We photographed them coming out, doing their thing. And I had two bodies from them, the D3X and the D3S, X and S, okay? So this is all the X shots. I'm sitting there doing these clicks. And you know, after a while, he's like, okay, I got the shots. There's the burrow. I got them sitting there. So then what? I put the D3S on there and I shot video. And the video was the big thing. The video, they, they sat there and they, and they saw the animals, what they, how they groomed themselves. They saw how they interacted with themselves. They saw what they were foraging on. They wrote articles like a nature and stuff just on the video. The video was huge. That was big time because it was a critter nobody knew anything about. And so for 14 hours, we sat on these rocks. Now, since these critters, we don't know anything about them, okay, we literally sat on the rocks. Okay, so there was no like tree visits, okay, or anything like that, okay. We sat on that rock for 14 hours. We got the shots. It's kind of what it is we do. It's really what you can do, okay. Starting in your own backyard. Wildlife photography is not just for Moose Petersons or anybody else. It's for everybody to go out and do. And more importantly, get out there and share those pictures. Now I showed you that you know so often in humor the pictures of the skunk. But to me, this is truly the skunk shots. If you follow my blog, you know I talk about the bastard. Okay, I talk about the bastard a lot in the wintertime. He literally lives in the backyard of our property. In the morning, I go out and I see the damn droppings. Okay, seriously, I don't know how many hundreds of hours I've spent on snowshoes trying to photograph the white-tailed hare. And in, 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 in the biology world, the biologists know this. They know I've been skunked just forever by this one rabbit. Okay. Um, and Link, the guy who did the, the, the charge of the, the pika and the marmot program a few weeks ago, said, hey, we're going to go after the Alaska hare. Are you going to come? I said, you know my success rate with white rabbits, right? Because uh, Alaska hare isn't the snowshoe. It's another um, critter that's been photographed almost zero. Okay? So who gets to call up and, and you know, go after the shot this is myself. Well, this is the bastard. Okay? I have two clicks of him after hundreds and hundreds of hours. <laughs> okay. That is wildlife photography. That's how it works, okay? That's what I want to encourage you to get involved in. It's this thing that go out. We're so fortunate to go out and see these wonders. Um, there's so many wonders still around that even though so many have gone and extinct, that we can go out and shoot. And then once you get that shot, share it, okay? People ask me why I blog so much. I'm very fortunate. I see a lot. I want to share it, okay? That's the whole thing. Anybody have any questions? Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, with such a long lens, so if you've got 600 with a teleconverter, you're like at about 1,200. Do you pick a spot and focus on that because trying to follow an animal would be? Question is, kind of, do I pre-focus on a spot and, and work that way? No, I don't. I'm constantly moving. Basic hand-holding technique. You've got to know it to the point where you don't think about it, which means um, typically, you have to pick up the camera every day. Not necessarily shoot with it, but pick it up. A lot of people go out shooting, and they, 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 it's common. You know, I get about 400 emails a day. So I, get, I hear these questions a lot from people. And they go out shooting for the weekend, and Saturday the pictures are so-so, not really sharp. Sunday the pictures are much better and they're much sharper. How come? I said, because on Saturday, you're getting yourself re-familiarized with that camera body. So on Sunday, you're good to go. So every day, I pick up the camera, OK? Um, my D3S is here with me. I don't go anywhere without the camera. I'm always shooting. Um, so when it comes to working with a wide lens to a long lens, I sit there and I put the subject in the frame where I want them, and I go click. Okay? If the AF focus point isn't on the subject because the way I've arranged the elements of the frame, I do this very old-fashioned thing people don't know about. It's called manual focus. Okay? <laughs> I use it all the time. I manual focus a lot. Yes, sir? Bat was affected by flash. How does the flash affect uh, most other animals? The question is about flash and affecting critters. Let me tell you a story. I love I can tell stories all day long about this stuff. Okay, there's a there's a little critter. I have not photographed it still. Called the Point Arena Mountain Beaver. Uh, it's an endangered critter up in California. Um, almost nothing's known about it again, and it's nocturnal. It goes through these little grassways, right? So I built this this tunnel uh, with a flash port and all this stuff to go out and photograph it. And I got this call from a um, person at Fish and Wildlife Service. 
and she was brand new out of college. That's the worst ones, okay? <laughs> worst ones. And she said, um, I hear you're going to go out with uh, um, uh, Dr. Steele, you're going to go do this. And I said, yeah. She goes, well, you need a permit. I said, since when? And she said, what? And I said, I've never had a permit. I don't, you know, what's this all about? And she goes, well, we'll, we'll get back to that. She goes, how are you going to photograph them? And I said, are you a photographer? She goes, no. And I said, well, I said, in a nutshell, I've made this little cage and a camera port and sit there and photograph them with a flash. She goes, you can't use flash. And I said, what do you mean I can't use flash? Well, it's proven it, it, it disturbs wildlife. I said, seriously, what are the papers? Give me some citations. And she goes, what? And I said, citations. Oh, you're not stupid. <laughs> so she goes, I'll get back to you. So then I make two phone calls, and I call her supervisor in Oregon. I said, what the hell is this? You know, I need a permit, and Flash is going to citation about Flash. He goes, please tell me she didn't say that. I said, yes, she did. And please tell me she wasn't serious. I said, oh, she was very serious. And he goes, OK. So he calls up. She's gone. Because, um, you know, it worked for the federal government. She thought she had the power of God. Yep. And um, right off the bat, Flash doesn't hurt wildlife. Here's the deal. So unless you're a, a, a baby bird, I take my Flash and go, <laughs> And it goes and tells that late, next kid that the flash is really bad for him. To them, they don't even recognize it, OK? How many people heard of the Galapagos Islands? I mean, there's a place where critters have not had any negative effect with people. And so what's the response to people, OK? So flash is the same thing. You know it's going off? The, the slowest it goes off is 1 4 thousandths of a second. Most of the time I'm working, you know, when you're doing like a nesting bird, it's going off between 16 to 18 thousandths of a second doesn't even register. They don't have those kind of things. So flash and wildlife doesn't make any difference. Now, motor drive, especially like, remember the old FM2 MD2s or MD12s? That MD12, man, you go, wildlife go, OK? But that wasn't the flash. It's the, the, the noise. One thing that really, um, uh, like foxes, OK? You know the, the clips you have, the plastic clips that clip into, like on your day packs, your fanny packs, that click, click? That just drives foxes crazy. They're gone. They hear that once, and they're out of there. And it's a frequency we, we can't pick up, but whatever it is, uh, it was an interesting day. The first time I saw that, and I, the fox looked at me, and I'm going, this isn't good. And I did it, and he kind of looked at me, and I did it again, and poof. So we did a couple um, tests with the fox, and they don't like those clips. Wow. Mm -hmm. I got lots of biological trivia. That's what you know, I'm good at. That's what I do all the time. Yes, sir? Are there any particular ways you arrange your flash when you're out there? Is there any particular way I arrange my flash? Flash is all about light, OK? So the first thing is, when I'm using flash, I've got to look at the ambient light. And I see the ambient light, and I go, has it got the quality and the quantity I need for the picture? OK? So flash starts with understanding ambient light. So when I say it doesn't have either the quantity or the quality, the flash is going to be applied to supplement that. And that's always going to be changing. One thing I can tell you for a fact, though, when it comes to birds, right? They have feathers, they have lots of color. That whole plumage thing and that color thing is all based on light, which we take for granted, but them is very important. That's why they have this. It's mount, meant to bounce off that light, make those colors. That's how the guys get the girls all excited, OK? That basic thing. It works on the principle of angle incident equals angle reflection, OK? So if you're photographing, for example, the uh, just take the gorget on a hummingbird, OK? That big, beautiful red neck, right? It's curved. You point one light at that curved light source, and, it, and that light is coming from your flash, you know that light and the color is going to bounce away from you. Your camera won't see it. So right off the bat, it means you've got to move that flash. The problem is if you've got a curved light source with, or a curved color or surface that you're trying to photograph with a point light source, can you do it with one light? Can't do it. So then you need to have a curved light source. So a real easy thing for, for uh, hummingbirds is to get a piece of a plain old uh, white mount board, cut it and curve it, and bounce a flash into that. And then that will be light that comes from many directions to light up the whole throat. Okay? So that's, that's stuff that's really easy to learn in the backyard. But back in the day when we would do um, hummingbird workshops, people would get a packet from me with a red Christmas ornament. Okay? And they get the red Christmas ornament and go, I don't get it. I said. When you can light that Christmas ornament so that you can see red all the way around, you can photograph a hummingbird. Wow. Any other questions? Yes, sir? You have a shot of your son very close to a grizzly. Did 
Did the violinist know that good thing very well? <laughs> I wonder when that would come up. The shot of Jake with Bruno. Bruno is a, a, a scientific grizzly bear. He lives outside of Bozeman, Montana. Anybody see that series uh, on Geographic for a while where a grizzly bear is walking through Yellowstone and they're, they're looking at the biology of grizzly bear? Anybody see that? That was Bruno. And uh, I'm sorry, Brutus. Um, uh, in a nutshell, grizzly bears in Yellowstone uh, in August, they disappear. They go up to the Aberaski Mountains, to the Talus Slope. They're pulling off these boulders to get the eggs from these moths that migrate and live down in Kansas most of the time. Uh, because of climate change, the white uh, bark pine that moths are depending on are disappearing, so the bears don't have that food source. And to them, these moth eggs are the same as salmon to Alaska grizzly bears. Well, okay, so how big a rock can a grizzly bear, grizzly bear move to get to those eggs? Well, you can't just go up the slope of the wild grizzly bear, hey, uh, can you like turn that over and you know? So that's where Bruno came in and they, they, they have him do a lot of the basic grizzly bear biology, understand what it does. So that thousand pound bear can move an 800 pound rock. That's impressive as hell. That's just huge. So that particular photograph you're asking about, um, uh, Lexar, the folks that, are, that brought me here today, uh, they were wanting to do an uh, ad. And they said, what will you do it with? I said, I, let's do it with a grizzly bear. And they go, seriously? I said, yeah, I know a grizzly bear because a biologist is a good friend of mine. And I said, we can go do a shoot with them. And, uh, and they said, really? I said, yeah, we'll do it in the snow. Um, and they go, okay, we trust you. So we went up there and uh, he's an amazing grizzly bear. He's spectacular. And he's the only grizzly bear that I've ever, I've always wanted to pet and not pet but get my hand into his fur to feel the skin. Um, it's just amazing. Because I've held grizzly, uh, polar bears in my arms before, but never a grizzly bear. And um, so we, we did all that stuff. And, and he, to stay active all year round, he gets fed elk and all that kind of basic stuff so he doesn't hibernate. But they don't perform for that. So what he loves, and his biggest thing to perform with, is Mountain Dew. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so uh, having him kiss uh, Jake and Sharon and, and myself and Jake all got kissed by, by him. Uh, yes, sir? On the uh, uh, flash, do you tripod mount or do you do it all? Whatever I need. Arms? Whatever I need. Whatever yeah, there's not many recipes. And animals and Velcro. Say what now? Velcro with animals. Velcro with animals? Yeah. Um, no, I never really had a whole lot of problem with Velcro. Never had a whole lot. For more information, please visit us online, give us a call, or stop by our New York City Superstore. You can also connect with us on the web.